Welcome to The Perspective with Mike Sherbino and his guest co-host, Julie Stotland. Society's concept of beauty changes depending on the culture, but pop culture standards of beauty in recent memory often put people at risk of struggling with issues of self-esteem, especially for women and girls in a world where, by now we all know, the beauty standards may be set impossibly high, but still so many of us fall for it. Entertainment reports are filled with men and women alike shamed for their weight as social media calls out celebs who are too fat or too skinny and then publicly humiliated. Are the images and ideas of the perfect man and woman changing by calling these issues out so often in media? Today on the program, Mike and Julie are joined by a panel of multi-generational women to talk about women, community, dating, marriage, kids, careers, and all the pressures of life faced easier when we walk our life journeys with the peace and serenity of a relationship with God. Welcome to The Perspective today. I'm Mike Sherbino. My co-host is Julie Stotland. We're glad you're with us because we're going to unpack a pretty challenging subject today as we talk about body image and all that's related to that. I'm not sure that I even want to go there, but (laughs) we need to because we're all self-conscious of how we look and we kind of want to look our best, don't we? It's something I'm very familiar with. Yes. Oh, 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 apparently you're uh, you're, you're glowing. Yes, well, we better take care of that. Um, (laughs) <laughs> I think Natalie just mentioned that I need um, more than just uh, powder to, oh. to fix the defects. Well, you know. But Julie, you know, actually, two days ago, I get this um, weekly, daily rather, I don't even know what I'm saying, uh, news feed, and it's on exercising and the exercises that I need to be doing, okay. which I don't follow. <laughs> And uh, it said, you know, the most important exercise you need to do is for the most important muscle. And you know right. what the most important muscle was? Some people said the brain, other things, it's the butt. There you go. And uh, I haven't done them yet. <laughs> and, You're you not know, doing your squats? I'm not doing my squats as I should be. And they say that as they guys mean. get older like me, that one of the problems is we sit on our behind mm-hmm. way too long. <laughs> and I don't know, but that can be a, a very touchy subject uh, in today's society, isn't it? Absolutely. It doesn't matter what body part. We just seem to think, okay, what's most important? And then as we know, it depends on the culture. And it's very important to women, mm-hmm. but it's also very important to men. Yes, uh, somebody said that it's only a guy that can walk down the beach, you know, with a beer belly and bald and think that he looks sexy. And, <laughs> and you know, there, there is something about the male ego that it's hard to address. Yes, well, um, I'm not a male. <laughs> but in all seriousness, and, and I am being serious because this is just such a hard subject. No, it, it actually really is. I come yeah. back to the whole scripture where it says that God doesn't look on the outward appearance. He looks at what's on the heart. I know. But we are so self-conscious. We are so driven mm-hmm. by what is happening. And likely today, as you're watching, you're driven as well. And you're pondering, what do I look like? We all looked in the mirror before we walked out the door. And, uh, and maybe some of us should have looked longer. I think I should have. It was pretty early when I left today, Julie. Um, how do you process the whole image thing as a woman? You know, it's, it's so overwhelming. I grew up, and uh, you know my story, with eating disorders. Um, obviously, I was very consumed by it. And, and I talk about the fact that how eating disorders and, and, and the body image and everything, uh, that we're so consumed with how we present ourselves and how it affects our, our, our self-confidence and who we are and how the world sees us. And it's, it's something we can't ignore. It's something we have to really understand where do we get our identity? Where do we what's important is it the outside that's important or is it the inside and we need to understand it's the inside that's important and I know I spent my life working on understanding that it's the inside that's most important well I'm glad you're saying that because in the psalm David said uh, he thanked God that he was fearfully and wonderfully made oh that's awesome and as we unpack that truth Mm -hmm. today I want you to know that God loves you just for who you are just how Mm -hmm. you are today and we're going to be joining with a multi-generational women's panel in just a moment who are going to help us unpack this subject we'll be right back
One of the things that's important for us to understand as we process body image and how we look is the truth that we mentioned earlier. It was a truth that was revealed to Samuel when he was looking for a new king. Think about that for a moment. What do we look for? We look for strong, maybe robust, uh, maybe the right look. Uh, we've seen that in political campaigns as different potential leaders are portrayed in different ways. But what comes through to Samuel is this truth from God. And the Lord speaks into his heart and he says, Samuel, he said, man looks at the outward appearance, but I look at the heart. And so as we process, especially in our North American culture, what body image is all about, we need to hear a word from God where he says, I love you just for who you are. I want to read to you a scripture that has stayed with me for many, many years. It's a scripture that we can forget about, but when we come back to it, it anchors us. It anchors us and also becomes a compass for us as we process through the whole thing of how people perceive me. Having five daughters, I know far too well uh, the conversations that have happened around our table over what we look like and how we portray ourselves and what body parts are, need to be accentuated and from eyelashes to toenails. I mean, there is no ground that has not been covered in the Sherbino home. But I come back to the scripture where David says, you form my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. You saw my unformed substance and in your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me when as yet there were none of them. What is David saying is that God saw him when he was in his mother's womb and God created him in a beautiful way. We have a, an interesting way of looking at beauty, don't we? And as I've mentioned, having five daughters, I'm very conscious of that. And while I joked earlier about the exercises that I try to do, I got to confess that before the program today, I did not do my push-ups. So for those of you who didn't do it, you can just relax. And guess what? God loves me just for who I am. If you knew my story, you would know that there are a variety of things that have shaped me. Far before I had uh, five daughters with my incredible wife, Terry, before I met her, I had a younger brother. That's right, there's five siblings in our family and I was number four. And uh, you know, when they talk about me being number four, it was kind of like, oh, surprise, because I was not expected. And then there was another surprise, and that was my brother, Stephen. And when Stephen was born, he was born with Down syndrome. I was seven years old. I didn't even understand what that word meant. But I remember my dad coming home and saying what the doctors had told him. They said in those days, just take him, put him in an institution and forget about him. But he said, I'm not going to do that. He said, Stephen is a gift from God. And Stephen came home and shaped our life. I remember looking at him as I got older and I realized that there had been some deformities. But God actually brought miraculous healing to him. His uh, feet were somewhat webbed together. And suddenly, as my parents prayed for him, he was healed. You don't have to believe that. I know it's true. Stephen couldn't walk or talk, they said, or have any um, uh, normal functions. But at the age of two, he would drag himself across the floor, and he got up, and he started to walk. It was a miracle. In faith, my dad did what he did for all of his other kids. He bought a bicycle when he was seven years old. And Stephen began to ride his bike. Trust me, he was a terror as he drove over the streets of Toronto. And I'm amazed that he never got clipped when he was going through an intersection, always on his way to the donut shop. But in the middle of what we were seeing as a family, as I grew older and became his caregiver, I began to understand in a deeper way that is what's in the heart that counts. And in the simplicity of what people would say was his mind in the way that he functioned, he taught me the reality that God loves us not for what we look like or what we think we can bring to the table, but he loves us for who we are. And that's the transforming principle. It's a principle that you need to hear today because so often the media has just sabotaged us and destroyed so many people, young women, older women, young men, older men, because we're so caught up with how we look. I want you to know that Jesus, he loves you. He cares for you and he gave his life for you so that we can have what he called the abundant life. 
My co-host Julie has struggled with many of those issues related to body image and look. And Julie, I'm glad you're here to weigh in with me. Wow, that was powerful. You hit the nail on the head. I mean, it's, it's incredible. But uh, that's what we need. We need that message of uh, he knew us before we were born. And that's the most important. We are precious in his eyes. We are his, uh, he, a gift to him. And our lives are a gift. And we can be a gift to others. It doesn't matter what we look like. It doesn't matter what we say. Or I, well, it does matter what we say. But it doesn't matter about the outward packaging. It's how we love one another's. It's how we live our lives, how we care for one another. That's what's most important. And that can look many different ways, but that's what we need to focus on. Thank you so much for sharing that, Mike. We're going to go back to the panel. we got more to hear from them. And I want you to stay tuned as we continue to unpack this important subject. Well, welcome back to the program today. I'm excited that we have three uh, ladies that have joined us today to talk about this delicate subject. And I want to introduce them right away to you. First of all, we have Kendall Fontaine. And Kendall is originally from the States, Minneapolis. We're not going to hold that against her. She now lives in Uxbridge and helps us with the perspective. But she's also been married to Denver for three years. So welcome, Kendall. Thank We're glad you. you're here. And glad then. To be here. Coming in all the way from Sweden today, just to make Julie happy, is Trinity. <laughs> and uh, there's a tight relationship. I think it's called mother-daughter. But <laughs> Trinity, uh, you're in fine arts school. And you're studying there. And I know it was a great excuse to get away from home. But you know, we just applaud you for that. But we're glad you're here to uh, share your insights on the subject. And then last but not least is Chelsea, Chelsea Taze. And Chelsea. Hey. We're really glad you're here. <laughs> Chelsea is a fourth year student at Brock University, uh, going in to be a teacher, but she's also uh, our children's pastor at North End Church. And uh, can't say enough about you, Chelsea, except interesting, Trinity, your word means three. Uh, Kendall, you've been married for three years. You're the old lady in the group, I guess, today. <laughs> and Chelsea, you've been engaged for three weeks. So uh, yeah. there you go. All right, we got some questions for you. You're going to help us with this whole thing on beauty and image. Take it away, Julie. All right, Kendall, let's start with you. And everyone, listen to the same question, and I'll get, give you a turn each. But first, Kendall, what do yes. young Christian women who may be looking for a relationship have to deal with today? Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, there's a lot of things involved um, just in today's society. I think with the pandemic, um, there's dating apps, there's social media. I think it's just gotten a lot more complicated mm. um, than it used to be. As simple as just a guy calling a girl going on a date. That's kind of my understanding of it from all of my other single friends. How about you, Chelsea? Yeah, I, I agree with Kendall. Um, I, I think it's uh, a lot more difficult now to get into a relationship, especially just because of the pandemic and not being able to trust um, guys <laughs> to like see them since we're not supposed to actually see other people um, <laughs> that aren't in our household. <laughs> so I think that's definitely mm -hmm. a lot more challenging um, for some of my single friends as well. And you know, my lovely Trinity, how about you? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think it's, I think it's a, it's a bit of a different scene than it was a little while ago, like when you mom were, were on the dating scene of, of, you know, looking for solid, uh, men of faith. And I feel like even just in, I'm saying this is very broad, but I feel like this generation of boys are that, they're boys. <laughs> mm -hmm. I know, I have a lot of male friends and I know a lot of boys, not a lot of men. So, yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm going to move Sorry. on from there. Okay, we're going to come back and ponder that one. Uh, being a father of five daughters, and they're not all married yet, um, let's just talk about marriage. Uh, do young people still want marriage, the traditional marriage, kids, you know, the house, car, the white picket fence, or do they want freedom to travel or live less beyond their means? Trinity, why don't you uh, pick up where you left off and, uh, and help us with that one? What's on your radar? Well, for me, yeah, I would, I, I do desire to be married at some point. And uh, I personally, I love uh, being able to just do what I love. So I'm not particularly searching for a house necessarily, or like that typical, like house, car, 
kind of idea. I'm more, uh, if I get to do what I love and be with someone that I love, then that's, that's, that's kind of my. So, but right now you're not feeling a huge pressure is what you're saying. No, not particularly. Okay. Well, I'm going to go to Chelsea because Chelsea, uh, you've been engaged for uh, three weeks now and, uh, I think you probably want to get married. Is that John true? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I have always had the desire to one day get married and I'm, I'm excited to get married, obviously to my fiance. Right. Um, and all my life kind of, I've dreamed of that white picket fence working my dream job, um, as a teacher and all that sort of things. But I know recently a lot of myself and a lot of my friends have just kind of been questioning, like, is there more like, should we be actually traveling and seeing the world and everything before we start having kids? And I always kind of wanted to have kids when I was younger, like um, earlier, but now I'm like, wait a few years, <laughs> do do more in life and then start mm -hmm. kind of settling down and all that sort of thing. Okay, well, I appreciate your, uh, your honesty. Kendall, uh, bring us home on this question. Uh, how important are those things, uh, like marriage, kids, the house, the car? I think, honestly, that's a great question. I think there's a lot to address there. I, um, it also depends on if you're a Christian or non-Christian. I find a lot of Christians, um, we, we all want to get married. We want to have um, that married life. It's something that you really look forward to. And I think um, in our society, people do as well. I just have found um, we're more in the society of do what makes you happy, put yourself first. Um, it's highly pushed. Um, so if the marriage and kids doesn't make that person happy, then they don't really seem to care for those things. Or on the same note, if their marriage isn't making them happy, I feel like that causes them to leave. Oh, yeah. um, I also oh, think yeah. there's so much emphasis on the big wedding and the party oh, yeah. uh, surrounding it than the actual marriage. I've, yeah. I have non-Christian friends who will live together for years and not get married. And then later we'll save up money for that big wedding. So I have found that to be kind of interesting because they still want the big wedding, but the order might be rearranged and it's not necessarily about the marriage from what I've seen. <laughs> well, maybe that's a whole subject in itself, yeah, the whole exactly. level of what commitment looks like. But I know Julie has a question that's okay, burning gonna, away there. I'm going to aim this at Trinity first. And since you've got quite an international influence there being in Sweden and having students from <laughs> all over the place, how has and does the global pandemic affect dating today? Well, I think like, I think it affects people just even from, uh, from many of my friends who talk about being like isolated then to coming back into just normal daily life. People have been like, <laughs> like, you know, I don't know how to behave around people. So then you add uh, the whole, the idea of going on a date, which was already a concept that was, could, could be horribly awkward. It's like, <laughs> I, now I don't know how to be a human being even more than I did before. And I'm trying to be on a date. And yeah, so. <laughs> Kendall, what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with that. Um, my single friends who were trying to date during the pandemic, I know it was super hard for them. Mm -hmm. um, they, they were just saying it was super hard because of the isolation in the pandemic. You can't really go out and meet people. A lot of them had to join, not had to, but that was one of their <laughs> options to join a dating app. <laughs> And uh, for them, it was just so weird because you're just talking over texting or a call, but you're not actually seeing this person um, face to face. Right. So I think it just causes a weird uh, dimension to it. And when you actually meet in real life, it you already kind of know them because you were talking. So I think it just adds a whole nother element. And Chelsea, bring us home on this. <laughs> yeah, no, I completely agree with those points as well. Um, I think a main factor of... Um, of this is just fear um, in and of itself of, yes, just like Trinity said, like it's, it can be fearful or awkward, like to go out on a date in general. Um, but now just having been isolated for so long and now having this fear of actually going into like um, public places with somebody that you don't know as much, mm. um, that can be fearful as well. Um, I know a lot of my friends, it, it can be really scary. Okay, so I wanna take us a little different way because we've talked about it earlier. I want to talk to you about how social media has affected self-esteem. And in the beginning of the program, you know, we're talking about what people look like, you know, what is in, you know, the right um, type of body to have and all those various things. How do they affect you ladies? Uh, and how have you processed that? Share your thoughts with us. I'm going to start with Kendall. 
I think this is a great question because for me personally, it affects my self-esteem a lot. Um, I actually had to delete almost all of my social media because I didn't like the way it affected my mind. Uh, I've always struggled with body image and I had uh, an eating disorder back in college. So for me, I know that I have to set mental and spiritual boundaries for myself um, in any way that I can. So for myself, I set boundaries by taking long breaks of social media or deleting completely. Well, thanks for that transparency. Uh, Chelsea. Quick thought. Yeah, um, social media definitely affects uh, girls and women's self esteem for sure. Um, I know for me, like I want to say that I want to delete all my social media accounts, uh, but the truth is that I just I can't. I really enjoy them for other other aspects of the, like the social aspect of them. Um, but seeing other women, I feel like it's just a big comparison game, um, mm -hmm. and the whole factor of like likes and comments, and you see your other friends. Um, getting more likes and you get so caught up in the like I feel like I get so caught up in like oh did my picture get over a hundred likes oh my goodness and then I feel <laughs> like I'm judging myself based on other people's likes which is just dumb in reality <laughs> okay well that's helpful what I'd like is for you and just to stay right there we're going to talk with you in a moment uh, but first we're going to take a short break and we're going to come back Trinity and get your thoughts on this whole subject as well Okay, Trinity, we left uh, our part one of the panel asking Kendall and Chelsea about the negative effects of social media on young women's self-esteem. How do you see it? Well, I think that like, as I, I don't deal with it as much with social media being a, a downer on my self-esteem, but I do have a lot of friends that I know it has affected right. really negatively, where it's, it's not just something they do for fun, but it's something where they where a way, place to seek fulfillment and I mean as the fact that women in general already have a tendency to have body like uh, like they issues with seeing themselves as beautiful and stuff and I mean I have that as well that I, I definitely think that social media has been something that hasn't really it hasn't made that easier it's actually made it it's made it easier to feel insecure about yourself more often and it's kind of been woven into culture uh, for my generation. So if I could jump in for sure. a moment uh, and picking up what you just said, Trinity, uh, let's jump down to Chelsea uh, for a moment. Talk to me about how your walk with Jesus, because each of you ladies uh, are Jesus followers. How does that inform uh, your journey and how you process who you are in light of all the pressure that society puts on you in social media? So how does your walk with Jesus change the way you do life? Yeah, no, that's a great question, Mike. Um, I think when it all comes down to it, it's just the the question of identity. And it's uh, who am I, uh, right? Like a lot of girls, like it's starting so young, question, well, who am I? Like, what's my purpose? Like, and identity has such a big impact, obviously, on who you are. Um, so when I think about it, I just, I know that my identity is in Christ. Like I am a child of God. I am a daughter of a king. Like these things, I just, they're just affirmations for me. Um, and I just turned back to like, I am fearfully and wonderfully made, like mm -hmm. I am beautiful. And like, it's hard to speak those things over my life, obviously at points, cause we all deal with that, but just continually choosing to, um, like affirm myself of God's truths and God's promises, um, mm -hmm. really just helped me to, um, yeah, just, just be affirmed in, in who I am and my beauty as a daughter. Oh, that's so cool. Um, Kendall, help us with the same question. You shared uh, yeah. some struggles that you had back four, five, six years ago. How has your walk with God pulled you out of that spiral? Yeah. 
Yeah, totally. So I maybe Julie wants to comment. Echo, yeah, I could honestly echo what Chelsea said. I think a huge part for me has just been finding my full fulfillment and identity in Jesus Christ. Um, and filling my mind with truth. I think that's a really key thing for me is just diving into the word every day, spending time with God. And I think being able to discern those lies from the enemy, um, when I get a negative thought about myself, I try as hard as I can to replace it with truth. And I present it to God. And am I like, is this a lie? Is this truth? And then um, that helps me know if I want to keep it or reject it. And so that's been a huge thing for me. And just remembering that, um, like Chelsea was saying, that we are created uniquely and perfectly by a perfect, perfect God. And um, and something I always remind myself, too, is at the end of the day, no one's going to remember me, what I looked like for or for my body or what I looked like. Um, but they'll remember how I treated people. And oh, I just absolutely. pray that they see Jesus through me. Oh, really good point. Oh, I, I, I do we have time to have a uh, yeah, Robert? Trini, give us your final thoughts. I, I can only just agree with both of uh, Kendall and Chelsea and saying that you know, just clinging and, and proclaiming the promises of God over yourself is so important. And even just recently, like I was going through a season of where I wasn't doing that, and one day I decided, okay, I'm going to write down every lie that I'm believing right now, mm-hmm. and it was way longer of a list than I expected it to be. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's what I've been proclaiming over myself. So it's just so important to to put God's view on you as the most important and highest opinion that you have of yourself. Wow. Well, thank you, uh, ladies, for mm-hmm. what you've shared today. It's been fantastic. It's been awesome. And I want to take a couple moments as we conclude the day. Tucked in my Bible is a little piece of paper I've had for years. Charles Swindle wrote this comment. He said, we've all blown it. Show me the guy who wrote the rules for perfectionism. I guarantee he's an ale-biter with a face full of pimples whose wife dreads to see him come home. Furthermore, he forfeits the right to be respected because he's either guilty of not admitting he blew it or he's become an expert at cover-up. And in essence, it means it is so easy to put on the facade, to pretend we're something that we're not. But I hope if you take something away today, it is this, that God loves you for who you are. And he's inviting you today to come into the warmth of that relationship of knowing that you are loved by him, that he's given his life for you. And without him, life is lonely. Trust in him.